Take your Bible, turn to 1 Peter if you would please. 1 Peter chapter 3. Do we have any, anybody here who is an only child? Couple. Okay, well, go ahead and go out and wait for us in the parking lot, all right? Because this ain't for you. No, this is for everybody. If you, if you had siblings, you had family members, cousins, um, like Rose, who's related to 90% of Fredericktown, I find out. I should have known when I brought up two guys from Fredericktown. She, yep, they're my cousins. Everybody in Fredericktown's related to Rose. They need to move out of that county and kind of clean the bloodline up a little bit, don't you think? Anyway, when you are raised with siblings or cousins, brothers and sisters, even parents, how do we handle disagreements? Not very well. My sister and I were notorious fighters. And my mom would tell you that she just got absolutely sick of it. She had certain remedies to deal with us, brothers and sister, who fought each other. She would call me names, tell me she hated me. I would remonstrate, tell her names back, tell her I hated her. And the worst thing, some of the worst things that mom did to us was make us sit down with our arms around each other hated that. I hated that. And the reason why I hated that is because I hated her. Or, Dave, you ever had castor oil? Try it on your kids sometime. If you've ever, if you've ever drank motor oil, it's about like that. It's worse than that. Castor oil was used by my grandmother. She raised children in a single parent home and they got a dose of medicine once every Friday and it was castor oil. Purged the body. And um, so my mom bought a bottle. We didn't know what it was. And we fought one time and my mom took a tablespoon, not a teaspoon, tablespoon of castor oil and made me and my sister swallow that for fighting and we hated that hated that bad and it got to where we honestly we talked amongst ourselves one time we were going to get rid of that bottle that bottle was going to come up missing but then I was afraid I'd get a whipping for that and I didn't want to whip it but we were we fought we fought, 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 and fought. Now I would kill anybody who hurt my sister. I'd just about kill them. I love her to death. And uh, she's had to endure me. I've endured her. A lot like a marriage. Same goes for my wife and my children. I love them. Would die for them. Would kill for them. Uh, but sometimes we don't get along. And when family doesn't get along, that's, that's hard to deal with because I am very, very family oriented. Family means everything to me. If you don't have family, what do you have? You're a lonely human being. And um, what, some of my greatest fears is that I'll lose my family. And God used that on me at one time in my life. Mike, I'll take your family away from you. That scared me. That scared me. So God knows my soft heart when it comes to my family. And I've learned something. That when it comes to my family, my wife, my children, my grandchildren, 
They're not perfect. And it's wrong for anybody to assume that my children must be sin proof just because they're my children. I'm not. I'm not. And so they've had to endure a lot of pressure over the years. A lot of criticism. A lot of hatred. Um, and I have learned over the years to long suffer with them. They're harder to raise once they're adults. Amen? You worry more about Charlie now than you ever did? So I've had to learn long suffering. On the way down to Ron's yesterday, it's about an hour down there, I decided to listen to scripture in my car, uh, Alexander Scorby reading the King James, and I just just randomly selected Colossians, and I listened to that three or four times, then I pulled up Ephesians, listened to that three or four times, and both of them said the same thing. Both of them did, and I went, that's not an accident. So God was reminding me of something that as, a, as the head of this family and this family, that as I would be long-suffering with my blood family, I also should be long-suffering with my spiritual family. Because... Both books, Colossians and Ephesians, I selected at random. And, and you know how you listen to something but don't listen to it? God made sure that I heard out of both of those books what I'm going to share with you today. God made sure I did. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Are you there? Say amen. Finally, be you all of one mind. Try that on. Be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. And then he said, love as brethren. And that's what facilitated me asking anybody here, have siblings. Because if they're your family, you have a natural love for them. Today's the day that my granddaughter who's now in heaven, was brought into this world. And I told you the story that when we found out that while she was still in the womb, that she had a congenital birth defect, it was a diaphragmatic hernia, and we found out what that meant. It meant that there was no barrier between her bowels and her heart and her lungs. Children born in that condition rarely survive because the lungs and the heart don't grow and develop to be strong enough to live. If the child can get an operation after they're born, they repair the hernia, they keep the child in the ICU, and hopefully the heart will then grow and the lungs will grow. She lived five weeks in the NICU and passed away. And I had determined that I wasn't going to get attached to this child. Because I thought somebody's going to have to preach the funeral. I wasn't trying to be cold or calloused. I was just guarding myself from the emotions. And... My wife came home one day and she stuck the ultrasound of her on their fridge. And I would catch myself glancing at it and turning away. I made it a point after she was born to not hold her, not touch her, not hold her hand. Thinking that would work. When they came in and told us that she had finally died, it was like a tree fell in on me. 
and I didn't handle it too well. And you never get over that. When you have family, you automatically love them. That's called, uh, what's the Bible word for it? I can't remember the phrase now. It's in the Bible. But it's a natural love that we have for our own blood kind. God put that in us. You can't help but love your own family. You can't help it. And I was trying to shield myself from having natural affection. That's what I was thinking of. From having natural affection toward this baby. And it didn't work. Because I realized that's my kindred. That's my offspring. And I loved her for no other reason than that. And she broke my heart. Now, church family is no different. Church family is no different. When all of us have the same father, and Jerusalem above is our mother, it is in us to love God's people. After all, who else do we have? Who else do we have? So that's why he said love is brethren. Do you think Peter got along all the time with the other disciples? When you study the Gospels, you study the book of Acts, you'll find out that Peter did not get along with everybody. After Christ died, Peter just w walked out. He said, I'm going fishing. He left. Thought he could walk away from it. Next thing you know, here comes Jesus. Okay, chasing him down. Peter got into it with Paul. Paul chewing him out for how Peter was wrong in dealing with the Gentiles in front of everybody. They didn't go aside somewhere and hide it. Paul confronted him to the face in front of everybody. And you know what? You know what? How Peter responded to that? You got your Bible open. Turn to um, 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 15. Peter said, An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. How did he refer to Paul? That idiot? That stupid guy that I don't like, Paul. Even he says it. Now, don't pay no attention to him. That's not what Peter said. Peter called him his beloved brother, Paul. It means he loved him like a brother. Like brothers are supposed to love each other. It's the way he loved him. And he said, love his brethren, back in uh, 1 Peter 3, love his brethren, be pitiful, and most of us are, that was a joke. That means have pity on your brothers and sisters. Be concerned about them. Be full of concern and pity for what your brother or your sister is going through. Care about them enough. Be pitiful. Be what? What's that next word? Courteous. We've forgotten how to be courteous. Then he said, not rendering evil for evil. Don't get back at them. Or railing for railing. Railing means you railed on somebody. You chewed them out. You went after them. Or they went after you. And you decided, I'm not going to say anything back to them. By the way, you want to make a guy that's railing on you angry? Take it. Take it. That will infuriate him far more than if you punched him in the nose. Because he's wanting to fight. He or she's wanting to fight. And when you take it, what did Jesus do when they railed on him? He took it. He took it. Not no, railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing. Knowing 
that ye are thereunto called that you should inherit a blessing. Let's pray. Father, I ask for your help, the necessary grace to preach to your people. Teach me first. I need this. I need it bad. So, Father, put it in me, instill it in me. Let me be a blessing to my people, my family. These are the people that you've given me, and I care more for them than I care for anybody in this world. I pray that you'd bless them and speak to all of us, Father. Remind us that we are still family. And bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, turn to 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> These are the kind of people that God called into this family. And I want you to notice this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. Paul said, for you see your calling. So... Look around. Look around this room. Bunch of rednecks and goat ropers and drunkards, drug addicts, adulterers, liars, cheaters, thieves. Who in here has a PhD? Not a one of us. It just doesn't fit well. I got offered a doctorate degree, and I was encouraged to take it. Somebody said, you know, hey, you'll, you'll be recognized better for being Dr. Hoggard. And that just didn't fit. Just didn't fit. So I refused the honorary doctorate. I've turned down other jobs. Wouldn't take them. Because I love this family here. And I'm not above anybody in this room. I didn't graduate Bible college. I dropped out of two of them. Didn't graduate. Don't have a degree. Don't have a, letters behind my name. I don't have anything. Don't, don't call me reverend, whatever you do. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. If we were still in England, we would know a little bit about nobility as ascribed in Great Britain and in other nations where they have a kingdom. Nobility is a title, the Duke of this or the Duchess of that or Sir so-and-so or Lord so-and-so, they still have those titles and they are still valid in England and to receive a, a knighthood or to be... There is still in England as part of their parliament a house of commons and a house of lords. And they still have hereditary titles that are passed down Lord so-and-so gave birth to a son and he will be Lord so-and-so in his father's place and he will sit among the house of lords in parliament. It's granted to him by birth. They still have that over there. We're not used to that here. But that doesn't mean that there aren't people in this country who think that their doo-doo doesn't stink like everybody else's does. Amen? And some of you write down that I said that word behind the pulpit. The fact that I said it means that I ain't like them. I don't like people who think that they're better than everybody else. I can't stand people like that. And I'd, I've been through that. One of the Bible colleges I went to was where the elite of the denomination went. The rich people of the denomination sent their sons and daughters there to find suitable mates. And I found out it only took me one semester to find out that I did not fit in there. That was not my crowd. Because in that group was a bunch of dirty skunk suck-ups who were using their name or whatever they could do 
to gain recognition in the denomination and they immediately didn't take to me. I found myself making friends with the guys that nobody else cared for. That was my crowd. That was, those were my buddies. And I'm still that way. So Paul makes a point to tell us, look around you. See your calling. Look who's, look who's in the family with you. Not many mighty, not many noble are called. Uh, I tease Rose about being Fred, from Fredericktown. I guarantee you there's no nobility in Fredericktown, Missouri. Everybody down there. And there's names down there that if you use certain last names down there, you're either going to get a grin or a growl. Same way in a lot of places that we like to live. Verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. So, God called us as fools. The elite crowd in this country, the PhDs and the doctors and the professors, would scoff at us for being ignorant and unlearned because we believe in the literal creation, we believe in God, we believe in a Savior, we believe in sin, we believe in morality, we believe all these fundamental principles out of the Bible, we believe them strongly and we're not giving them up. We're not letting go of our guns, we're not letting go of our Bible, we're not letting go of our salvation, we're not letting go of the things that God has bestowed upon us. He has taken the foolish of this world and given us wisdom far beyond what this world has. If you believe that God created the universe in six days, you are wiser than any professor in this world. Somebody say amen. And he said, he chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. I used to think that it would be great if the Hollywood actors and the, and the sports heroes would all get saved and they would help spread the gospel everywhere. But that's not who God picks. God doesn't pick the famous and the high and mighty and the strong and the wise. He picks the weak. People who got caught up in sin. God uses them and he favors them above everybody else who think that they don't need a God. Well, I do. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. I used to say of this church, I still say it now, we're the Isle of Misfit Toys. Rejected. Despised. Frowned upon by the world. So we came here to find a refuge. I didn't come here and beg God to stay here to be frowned on, despised, and rejected. It's unusual for a pastor to remain in a church so long. And I can tell you it's not easy. But I need this place. I need it. And if God brought you here, you need it too. You don't want to be anywhere else. There's no other place for me to go. That no flesh should glory in His presence. So, those of you who are better than somebody else here, stand up and leave. Because God can't use you. He won't use you. Because God won't let us glory in the things of this flesh. He won't let us do it. So he called the simple-minded. He called the foolish. He called the weak. He called the addicts. He called us here to be here. To be family to one another. Do you not feel the same way as I do? 
Now turn to Galatians chapter 6. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, raise your hand if that's you. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And I can tell you that there are people who will not come to this church ever again because there are sinners in it. And they accused me of condoning their sin. They don't know that the people that they accused came to me and confessed it. And once they did that, it's not anybody else's business. But they left. Because they found, they heard a rumor that there was somebody here that did something wrong. Duh. Do you quit AA because you find out the guy sitting next to you is an alcoholic? Philip, would you quit if you went to a meeting and you found out the guy next to you was a dope head? Drug addict? No, you put your arm around him and say, I can see you're having a hard time. Wouldn't you do that? When you do that, you know why? Because you'll be next. Say that again. You're just one bad decision away. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Not cockiness, not arrogance, not I caught you. Not like that. Considering who? thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And I guarantee you, you start getting an attitude about people and God will let you fall big time. He'll let you fall hard. Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. That, listen, this is, applies not just to flesh and blood family. It applies to marriages. Is not marriage a lifelong lesson in long-suffering? There's four L's there. Lifelong lesson, long-suffering. That's what it is. It is, I put up with this because I love her. Or I let her do this, or I let him do this, because I love him. And my love for him, and the things that he does, or the things he doesn't do, or how he is, or how she is, doesn't matter to me. I can live with that. But you decide that you can't live without the one you love. Bear you one another's burden, so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing... He deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. So who ultimately are you responsible for? According to that verse, you are responsible for you. You prove your own self. You worry about you. You deal with you. Let every man prove his own work, and he shall have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another, for every man shall bear his own burden. Now, is this a contradiction? He says in verse 2, bear you one another's burdens, and then he says, every man shall bear his own burden. Which is which? Both. They're not contradictory to one another. If I didn't care about each and every person sitting here in this room, and those of you online, if I didn't care, I wouldn't be here. I'd have left a long time ago. I would have pulled out when it got hard, and went and did something else. But I have, a, I have a responsibility, and God dealt with me yesterday about being long-suffering, about being gentle, about being kind to people 
who sometimes they're not always kind to me. Zechariah chapter 13. I called this the wounded brother. You ever, you ever had your feelings hurt by somebody you love? Fact is, the only people who can hurt my feelings are the people I love. People I don't care for, they don't bother me what they say. I don't care. Doesn't amount to flip to me. People that I don't know or people that I don't like, what they say about me, that's on them. I don't care. But it hurts me when somebody I love says something to me or about me. If I didn't love you, then I wouldn't care what you think about me. But the fact that you love somebody, when they hurt your feelings, you get wounded deeply. Have you, let me just put it like this. Have you ever done that to somebody? Have you ever hurt somebody that loved you, that cared about you? Have you wounded them deeply? See, now we know what we're talking about, don't we? Because we've, I've done it. I've offended people maliciously hurt their feelings. Sometimes I did it knowingly. Sometimes I did it not knowingly. And I've had to be, somebody came to me a while back telling me that they had a grudge against me and they explained why and it was something I'd, I had no idea I had done. But I apologize just the same and I'm glad they came to me because I needed to hear that. I need to be more careful things I say, things I don't say. So I call this the wounded brother. Zechariah 13, 6, one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thine hands? This is actually a prophecy of Christ. He was pierced in his hands and his feet. Then he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Think about it. Who nailed him to the cross? First of all, it started out Judas Iscariot. Betrayed him. One of his own friends betrayed him. Sold him for money. Then his own people that he came to die for, the Jews, they, had, they were offered a choice. Barabbas or Jesus. Pontius Pilate wanted a way out of this. He thought for sure they would have him kill Barabbas because he was a murderer. And let Jesus go. But they said, crucify Jesus. Give us Barabbas, crucify Jesus. Jesus was wounded in the house of his friends. Did he take it? Yes. He took it. Why? Because he loved him. You don't divorce your wife simply because she's in a mood. You just don't walk out and leave her. You love her. God dealt with me years ago about that. I wasn't being a good husband. And my wife and I, we just, we made a, a deal. She wanted somebody to listen to her. And I swore an oath that day that I would. I'd listen to her. And I told her, I said, now I may not always like what you say. I may not agree with what you say. I may not like how you say it. But I'll always listen to it. And she listens to me. And it's not easy. It's not easy. But I made a promise that I would do that. Even though I get wounded in the house of my friends. I know and have known for years. I had a man on the board who sat on my board for years. And every Sunday he'd have roast preacher at home. He would run me down, talk about me, 
how wrong I was on this, how wrong I was on that. Accused my wife of writing my sermons for me. He did it to people in this church who then got upset and left. Imagine that. People that I cared about, people that I loved. So I'm aware that things are said to me and things are said about me. I'm aware that I don't do everything right. I'm aware that I can't please everybody. That bothers me. Because it's in my nature to please people. And when I can't do that, it bothers me a lot. Bothers me enough that if it comes at the right time, I want to say they deserve somebody better. So being wounded in the house of your friends is not easy. It's not easy to take. Isaiah 53, 5, Christ was wounded for our transgressions, was he not? Did he not take it willingly? Did he reject it? No. Did he willingly? They didn't have to force Jesus down on that cross. They didn't have to stick a spear to him and say, lay down there. He did it willingly because he loved the brethren. And when you love people, you'll do the same. Even if you get wounded by them. Our egos are easy to bruise, aren't they? They say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never harm me. But that's not true, is it? Words hurt worse than a beating. A child would rather you spank them than curse them. Am I right? Parents, don't ever curse your kids. Don't, don't you ever call them names. Don't you ever do that. You're to love them and understand that they're children. And then you take that same thing and you apply it to everybody here. We're just children. Needing one another. 1 Corinthians 8. Turn back there. Look at what Paul said. Paul was very cautious when it came to baby Christians and those who were weak. He was very careful. Because Paul, what kind of person was Paul? What kind of personality do you see Paul having? Gary? What kind of personality? He was abrasive. He could be a jerk, couldn't he? Absolutely. The guy, he was a zealot. And he was single. He didn't have a woman to say, would you sit down and shut up? He didn't have his wife sitting during his four-hour sermons going. That means cut it, Mike. He didn't have that. He didn't have nobody telling him what to do. He was a very abrasive, rough individual. And he learned by failure about how not to deal with weak people. Look at what he said. 1 Corinthians 8, 12. But when you so sin against the brethren, have you ever sinned against your own family and wound their weak conscience? Ye sin against Christ. There are people, don't you look around? Uh, Pam noticed that the place looks pretty. And uh, I took the credit for that, but I didn't do it. My daughter did that. And I like Christmas. I don't see anything wrong with it if it's done right. But there's some people out there that follow our ministry that don't do Christmas. Now, I don't wound their conscience. I don't tell them, what are you, communist? What are you, an atheist? Christmas, I don't do that. I will tell why I believe what I believe, and I'll use Scripture to do it. But I won't demand anybody do Christmas. If they, if they feel that God's told them not to, who am I? Who am I to tell them otherwise? Maybe some people know themselves well enough to know that 
when they go Christmas, they go all in. They $20,000 credit card bill, buying stuff for everybody. Maybe that's what they know about themselves and they just don't do it anymore. I can handle that. And it's not my job to wound their conscience. If they feel strongly about it, it is not my place. Can I hear you say amen? But when you so sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat, and he's talking about what you eat. If meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. What's the lesson here? Be careful of your brethren. Be careful of them. You could wound them easily. And I know this by experience. Having wounded others and being wounded by others. And I can get wounded easily. I am not thick-skinned. Not in any way. James chapter 5. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. You know what that's the equivalent of saying that is? Mom's coming home. Melissa, mom's coming. Trish, mom's coming. And if you're not, if you don't, if you don't knock it off, I'm going to tell her what you did. My sister could sign my mom's name better than my mom could. So I'd get one of those slips from school saying that I wasn't doing so well. And I learned I could take it to my sister and she'd sign mom's name. But then I learned blackmail. <laughs> Clean my room or I'll tell mom. Never dawned on me that she would get in much trouble as I did. <laughs> Grudge not one against another, brethren. You know, we have a problem holding grudges, don't we? Who are you mad at? In fact, let's do this. If you've been mad at somebody for five years or longer, raise your hand. Oh, come on. I, yeah, he's, he pointed at you. <laughs> I've held grudges. And I don't like it. The judge standeth before the door. And he'll judge me for it. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Colossians 3. I'm almost done. I'm not going to hold you to 12.30 today. It'll be more like 12.25, something like that. Colossians. And, it, and when I think about it, the only place in the world for me to get wounded and offended is either here or in my house. Because if you come looking for me any given day... I'm either going to be here or at my house. Where am I? If I get offended, where am I going to get offended at? It's either going to be here at my house. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, vows of mercies, kindness. You know what that means? The vows are the seed of our emotions. And we react to emotions and respond to emotions in our stomach. Do we not? When you're nervous or upset, you get a sick stomach, whatever. Bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. This is the first thing that God dealt with me with yesterday. Listening to Colossians, ignoring all of it until it got to here. Forbearing one another... And forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Have I offended you? I want you to know that I'm deathly sorry about it. 
because you are the last people in the world that I want to hurt. Am I capable of it? Yes. Will you forgive me? Forgive one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. That's what binds us together. And what is charity? It is love and giving without waiting for a return. Those of you who gave, why did you give? If you gave to get something back from God, I will remind you that you already have it. So you're not getting something from God. You gave because you love those kids. You love those starving people in Kenya. And you love your church. And you love God. And you love His kingdom. That's why you give. Charity. The bond of perfectness. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. I want peace. Desperately. To which also you are called in one body. And be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Then God said, Mike, that ain't enough. I'm going to hit you again. Turn to Ephesians 4. Verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. With all lowliness and meekness. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is learning how to keep your mouth shut when you think you have a right to say something. Amen? That's what meekness is. Lot went to Abram complaining feuding over well waters, over grassland for the sheep. Their herdsmen strove together. Lot said, I am, I'm sick of this. Abram kept his mouth shut. He said, Lot, wherever you, you take your pick, whatever field you want, whatever, whatever valley you want, whatever well you want, you take it. And he did. He chose to live towards Sodom. And Lot lost everything. And Abraham, God took Abraham right after that and said, look northward, southward, eastward, and westward. Everything that your eyes set upon, I'm going to give you that land. Who came out better, Lot or Abram? Abram. Why? Because Abram showed meekness. Abram had a right to put Lot in his place, but he chose not to. He kept his mouth shut. And who did God reward? Endeavoring to keep and did I read that? No. Long suffering, forbearing one another, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body in one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And then he says in verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath. And as soon as Alexander Scorby read that, I turned the radio off. And I said, God, I'm bitter. I'm bitter. You ought to confess that every now and then. Hurts. Tastes bad. But you get bitter. You get wounded. Start holding grudges. And then I'm not preaching to you in love. I'm preaching to you out of meanness. And I don't want to be that way. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. You see, because it's in my nature 
to have it out with somebody. I'll get into it with them and I'll show them how right I am. And that'll be the end of that. And I got to put that away. Be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Both of those. Forgive one another. Both of those. Put the bitterness, put the anger away. Put the quarreling away. Put it away. Get, get it. Don't, don't entertain it. Don't harbor it. Don't hold on to it. It's not worth it. I have to keep living with my wife and working with my family. I can't afford to be angry at them. And I have to see these faces every Sunday, faces that I want to see again next Sunday. And I can't afford to harbor feelings against anybody. It doesn't do any good. And I'll say this and we'll close. We're hoping that the president will succeed in winning one of these lawsuits to prove to the world that they cheated. That angers me more than anything. It angers me deeply. I want to go and shoot everybody in Washington, D.C. Come on, Dave. Let's go. Hang them. By their toes. Nope. No, I can do it all myself. Here's what I think, Dave. I want that man to be the next president. Don't get me wrong. But if God saw that he was in the way of us trusting God instead of man, God would put him out. I don't like that thought. Because I hate lose. Oh, I don't want to lose to those people. Okay? I wore my Trump hat all day yesterday. I don't care who sees me in it. And when you sent me that text Friday, I didn't know that he'd lost that Texas lost that case without a hearing. And I hit my desk like that. I was mad. But let's say that Biden gets in, Kamala Harris ends up being president in six months. And now we're run, this country is being run by the Chinese Communist government. Because that's what's behind it. Right? Boy, I'd send Charlie over there in a heartbeat. Send him, tell him, go get him. JR won't be joining the Marines if Biden's president. But what if he is? We're that close to being like Canada. And their hatred for church people, because they know we're all Trump people, their hatred for us has increased in the last four years. And they're going to come after us with everything they've got. And they've got everything. They've got the judges. They've got the IRS. They've got everybody that can hurt us. They've got them now. And they'll get our guns. Will we need each other then? We'll need each other. And all the petty differences that we have won't matter, will they? They won't. So let's stand. And I want you to think of somebody this morning that you're upset at or you've been wounded by or maybe somebody you've wounded. And ask God for the blessing of being able to give your life for that person. So that'll, put, that'll change your heart. It changes a heart when you have to get down on your knees and wash somebody's feet. And it'll also change your heart 
when you ask God to let you lay down your life for somebody that's not worthy of it, in your opinion? What did Christ do? Lay down his life for people who were not worthy of it. 